Well, good morning and welcome to Church of the Holy Spirit. What a great hymn. If you caught the theme that was going on through that hymn, this is a description of what it will be, especially in glory, when Christ finally reigns in total over this earth. All sin, sickness, sadness will be banished and we will enjoy his kingly presence forever and ever and ever. Amen? Amen. 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 I'm only a little bit excited about that. Um, let's begin our service this morning. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open. All desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, the protector of all who trust in you, without whom nothing is strong, nothing is holy, increase and multiply upon us your mercy, that with you as our ruler and guide, we may pass through things temporal, that we lose not the things eternal. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. And now, as we are seated, let us attend our hearts to the reading of God's holy word. The first reading is from 1 Kings chapter 3. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I should give you. And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart toward you, and you have kept from you have kept for him this great and steadfast love, and have given him a son to sit on his throne today. And now, O Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, although I am only a little child. 
I do not know how to go out or come in, and your servant is in the midst of the people whom you have chosen, a great people, so numerous they cannot be numbered or counted. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil, for who can govern this great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. God said to him, Because you have asked this, and, not, and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or for the life of your enemies, but have asked for your understanding to discern what is right, I, know, I now do according to your word. Indeed, I give you a wise and discerning mind. No one like you has been before you, and no one like you shall rise after you. The word of the Lord. The psalm reading is from Psalm chapter 119. Your decrees are wonderful, therefore I obey them with all my heart. When your word goes forth and gives life, it gives understanding to the simple. I open my mouth and pant. I long for your commandments. Turn to me in mercy as you always do to those who love your name. Steady my footsteps in your word. Let no iniquity have dominion over me. Rescue me from those who oppress me, and I will keep your commandments. Let your countenance shine upon your servant, and let me your statutes. My eyes shed streams of tears, because people do not keep your law. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The second reading is from Romans chapter 8. The Spirit help, helps us in our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that the very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he call, those whom he pre, and those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who, put, he who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God, God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Jesus Christ, who died, yes, who raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for, you, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The word of the Lord.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and take and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that is thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets and threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all this? And they answered, yes. And he said to them, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, Lord Christ. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Please be seated. My glasses are still fogged up from the mask. There we go. Have you ever just had a bad day? (laughs) Maybe two. Um, There was a point in my life where I had become convinced that my middle name was Murphy. It, It seemed like all the events of my life were somehow governed by Murphy's Law. I'm sure you've heard of it before, but if not, Murphy's Law goes something like this. Whatever can go wrong, will go wrong. And it's mostly like a a lot of uh, little things. Like you pick the shortest checkout line, only to get to the front, and the lady right in front of you spends 15 minutes just to get her ATM card to work. Or the only time there's an accident on the road is when you're late to work. That's just Murphy's law. Um, So on Wednesday this week, it was our first day back from vacation, and I was up kind of late to get ready for morning prayer, and uh, I've got the post-vacation hangover, and, you know, just trying to, I'm moving, I'm not moving too quickly, but um, I, I knew, I mean, there's several steps to get ready for morning prayer, but I knew that as long as everything worked out right, I could get it set up quickly and we could get online and we could get the day started. Well, nothing worked right. Nothing. My computer wouldn't work. I would click on something and it would take like five minutes for the computer to respond. Restarting it was like too long of a process at this point because it just takes a long time. And I get to the last second, I'm like, what am I going to do? And about five 
to 9, I thought, well, um, I wonder if I could use my cell phone to do this. A lot of people go live with their cell phones. So I get my cell phone out, and I'm trying to get to the church page, and I click live, and I got it set up on a stand. And in the end, it kind of worked. Like, it, it didn't go to the church page, but it went to my personal page. And so, it, like, you were lucky if you found it. Murphy's Law is like a million, it's like a million little things that happen that when they add up, it just seems to go kind of beyond irony. Like, this is just too much. And it's almost as if, like, there's this invisible hand, there's this invisible force at work just trying to frustrate me. These things are pretty small, but... And they're, they're, they're relatively insignificant when you just kind of look at all of that. But the thing is, sometimes the things we face in life are actually huge. Sometimes they're scary. Maybe we lose a job. Maybe a child strays. Maybe our dreams don't work out. Maybe a loved one dies. I mean, life too often can bring disappointment and loss. And we can become disillusioned. Now, here's the thing. I'm of the opinion that it's okay to get mad at God. I really am. He's got huge shoulders. He can handle it. It'll be okay. The problem is, and we, is when we take all of life's disillusionments and we begin to blame God, I mean, despite the fact that he has done everything possible to prove otherwise, many of us too often live as if God is against us. And in Romans 8, Paul gives us several reasons why this is completely counterintuitive. This is completely against the truth. Because what What Paul lays out is the fact that God has proven over and over and over that he, God, is completely for us. And he totally loves us. I I know I have felt in the past that God was against me. There was a point in my life as a young Christian Um, early in my walk, that I really believed that I had done something, like I must have done something heinous, something so totally, completely offensive to God that he just had it with me, and he was done. And there was a period of time for about two years that I felt completely abandoned, alone, I honestly thought God had given up and left me. Now, thankfully, that that chapter subsided, and Jesus showed up in a very big way. But it wasn't until much later in my life that I just that I finally realized just how upside down that thinking is compared to what God had done to prove his love for me. And that is exactly what Paul is getting at in this passage in Romans. This whole, this whole list of quotable verses that we love to hand stitch and put up on the wall, or we, you know, we, we love to spit them out when things are going great in our lives. And yet what Paul is doing is he's taking a situation with the church in Rome And he's trying to convince them, no, don't feel this way because God is for you. Paul wrote the church of Rome. He wrote this whole letter to dispel many false ideas that they had about God. He he makes it clear that all, Jew and Gentile alike, remember in Rome there was this conflict between the the, the Jewish converts and and the, the Gentile converts. And he comes in and he says, no, all of you need Christ. All of you deserve God's wrath. 
And it's by God's grace by which we all have been saved, not by works. And it all comes by faith. And even the faith, the faith comes from God. Redemption is not about how good we are or how much we live up to God's law. Redemption is all about what God is doing for us. What He is doing on our behalf. And while we were still shaking our fist at God, God gave His life for us. God takes dead things and He gives them life. That was us. And he did it all out of love. And we get to this point in his letter where he categorically states that we are secure in him. That nothing, and I mean nothing, not even God himself, and especially our own bad attitudes can separate us from God's love. I, I think of being dad. This, this just reminds me of what it means to be a father. I mean, I love my boys with a fierce love. No matter how many, how many times and how much they make me mad, I still love them. And if necessary, I would walk through the fires of hell from my children. And, and this is imperfect, and it's, and it's just an inkling of the perfect fatherly love that God displays towards us. So when we read things like this, when we read that all things work together for the good, when we read if God is for us, who can be against us? It's with this deep sense of irony that Paul asks the question because the answer is resoundingly nothing. No one can be against us. No one, and especially not God. And it really doesn't matter how we feel about God at that particular moment. I mean, the will of God marches on despite how we how much we are tempted to continue shaking our fist at him Christ died for us while we were still his enemy do you really think that being mad at god for whatever reason is going to change his love for you See, 2,000 years later, Paul is addressing confusion and disappointment. That's no different than our own. And still, and still he says this, all things work together for good. See, the key to this passage, though, is interpreting the word good as God sees it. Good must be seen through the lens of of the cross. It has nothing to do with whether or not you get that primo parking spot out in front of the store. It's not dependent on that or any of the other little things that we like to attribute. Well, you know, everything works out for the good. You know, you could have been parked in the back 40. God still loves you and he's still working things out. It has nothing to do with that. Forgot where I was at. See, the thing with God's good is it sometimes includes hardships and sufferings. The goodness of God, the goodness that God promises is rich and it's deep, but not everything. I mean, He doesn't promise that everything's going to be perfect. It means that in the difficulties and sufferings that we face, that that are part of life, there's redemption. It means that as we face hardships, as we face sufferings, these losses that we face are not without grace. So when we see 
good through the lens of the cross. We were reminded of a Savior that suffered and died to make us His. And He intimately knows our losses. He knows how we feel because He's experienced it. He's not a dispassionate Savior, but is one who is close to the heart of the suffering. See, three sentences earlier in this passage, Paul points out that it's the Spirit that helps us pray in our weakness. It's the Spirit that helps us pray when things are so bad, we don't even know how to pray. You know what? You don't need words. And that's the point. Because God loves us that much. Especially when things are that hard. So I'm going to say this as directly and as succinctly as I can. The notion that God is against any one of his children is a lie from the devil. It comes from the pit of hell, and it smells like smoke. And when you're tempted to believe that lie, point it out, acknowledge it for what it truly is, a lie. There's nothing, not even God himself, that can separate us from his love. Not hardship, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword, not death, life, angels, rulers, principalities, things present, things to come, height, depth, or anything in creation. That list could have kept going, by the way. I think Paul ran out of ink. His love for us is certain, it is perfect, and it is true. Maybe it's just me, though. I need to hear these words every day. I need to be reminded of this every day. Because it's so easy to get caught up in the disappointments of life, and even the little things that we attribute to something as inane as Murphy's Law. If God would give His only Son for us, is there anything left that He would withhold? Is there anything left that's valuable to Him that He would choose not to give? No. He will give us everything else according to the text everything that happens everything that happens the good and the bad happens in our life for our good and we can rest assured we can take away the assurance that God is for us and that he loves us from now throughout all eternity Amen. At this time, we take the opportunity to confess what we believe about this great faith of ours by using the Nicene Creed found, well, in your bulletin on page 7. Would you stand with me? We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through Him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, He came down from heaven. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, He became incarnate from the Virgin Mary 
and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. And on the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and His kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, He is worshipped and glorified, and He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Prayers of the People, Form 3. Would you please pray responsively? Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. That we all may be one. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. We pray for Michael Curry, our presiding bishop, Gregory Brewer, our bishop, Father Rob, our rector, St. Barnabas Church, Deland, and Reverend W. Brian Garrison, Church of the Advent, Dunnellon, and Reverend William Barrett, and for all bishops, priests, and deacons. We pray for President Donald Trump, Governor Ron DeSantis, Mayor Brian Nelson, and for all who govern and uphold and hold authority in the nations of the world. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. Give to the departed eternal. Give to the departed, especially Brian Hardeman, eternal rest. We pray for your. We pray you for your saints who have entered into joy. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. Father, we do pray for the grace to penetrate our hearts that we may understand and believe how much that you love us. I pray for this church that you would empower us with your presence and spirit, that your light would shine brighter and brighter, and that through us you would spread your gospel near and far. We pray for the growth of the church and that uh, your blessing would be upon us, that you would reach many families, um, children, and many people that do not know you. Lord, would you call this church to be truly the church of the Holy Spirit that goes out around our neighborhood and city and the world. Lord, we pray for those whose hearts have been broken We pray for those who have suffered loss and especially those who have walked away from faith. We pray that your loving grace would draw your children back to yourself and that you would bring them into fellowship with you and the church. We thank you for all of these things, knowing that in Christ we have confidence in knowing that you are with us and for us. Our Lord, 
Lord our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people. In the multitude of your mercies, look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help, for you are gracious, O lover of souls. And to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. And now let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. And now, may Almighty God have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Would you please stand with me? May God's peace, his presence rest on you now and give you peace throughout the day, this week, and all eternity. The peace of the Lord be always with you and also with you. So, remember our uh, passing of the peace? Yeah, thank you. Good to see you. Um, and remember, too, that you're live on Facebook, so uh, we have a record. And <laughs> um, we're going to take a moment and go back and, and get ourselves liturgically prepped and washed for um, Eucharist. So take, uh, take a few minutes and greet each other, and we'll be right back.
Well, good morning and greetings. It is good to be here with you and to worship with you this morning. I want to say welcome to all. Welcome um, to those who braved the outdoors and came to worship in person. I know it's kind of hard to be at home, but um, for those of you at home, welcome as well. Um, we are glad that you joined us and for making that wise decision um, to stay home if that's necessary for you, but welcome everyone. Um, and especially those who are visiting, um, looking across, I, I don't see any visitors here inside the church, but very uh, likely there are visitors online. We want to say thank you for being with us this morning. If you will drop a comment in the, in the, the comment section of the video, just saying hi and where you're from. We would like to acknowledge your visit this morning. Thank you for being with us. Um, we want to take a moment to acknowledge uh, birthdays and anniversaries. We have birthdays this morning. Somebody's pointing. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> I know, I'm looking out over there, like, I know there's a birthday here somewhere. Uh, but yes, my, my Soren um, turned 12 this week, and, uh, so, and we, had a, we had a fun birthday, and it's a birthday week, so more things are happening. So anybody else? Okay, would you, uh, Jan, did you have a birthday? Okay, um, would you join me in prayer? Father in heaven, we thank you so much um, for... The, the milestone of a birthday. We thank you so much for the years that that represent, represents and for the years that are to come. We thank you, Father, um, that you have shaped um, Soren into the, the young man that he is today and for the life that you've laid out for him. Would you bless this year, um, bless him abundantly, give him joy and peace as he walks with you, and uh, we'll be careful to give you thanks. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now, anniversaries. Do we have any anniversaries? Yes! Hensley's. Go ahead and stand up. You're not coming down here because for obvious reasons. But, um, but we do definitely want to pray for you. I'm actually going to step out here. Um, would you join me in prayer? Father in heaven, we thank you for the gift of marriage. We thank you for what it, it tells us about Christ and the church, we thank you that, um, that you have blessed these two, your children, for these many years, the ups and downs, for all that has shaped them into what they are today. And we thank you for this coming year. We pray your blessing on them, that you would bless them abundantly, that this would be a joyous year for them. And um, Lord, we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And is anybody traveling Know why anybody would be traveling? Oh, I say that we traveled last week, so and survived somehow. Okay, uh, Jan. It's a big. It's a big bag. It's a big bag. Grand Poobah. Come on up. <laughs> <laughs> Good to see you. We thank you for all of the years of all you've done with the story so far and so forth. This is a present for you. <laughs> Very good. So, Jan, describe what that is. It is a t shirt for the Chili Cook Off. So, so these, are all, these are all the t shirts from Chili Cook Off. And then every year there's a two, there was a new t shirt. And that's been woven into a quilt. Oh, that's 
that's beautiful. Congratulations. Thank you. Just a couple few things um, as they are taking their seats. Most of us have been here for our new Eucharist pattern, but not everybody. And so uh, you will be dismissed when it's time for Eucharist. You'll go to the outside of the row and then come in and then enter your seat down through the middle. And we'll be um, serving Eucharist out in front of the altar so there's no uh, kneeling at the altar during this special social distance. I don't even know what to call it. But um, just follow the person in front of you, and uh, it'll be obvious how that's going to unfold. And then the same thing with the dismissal. Um, The ushers will dismiss you this morning. We'll go out two doors on the side just so we don't kind of pile up around the exits. And again, thank you for wearing the masks. I don't like it either, but thank you. Um, it, is, it is important that we do that. It is share, sharing and showing love to our neighbor. So please continue doing that. Um, there's, again, no prayer ministry during our abbreviated COVID service, and there's no coffee hour or Sunday school. So just want to remind you all that. And then the last thing is um, you do have opportunities to give just because we don't pass the plate for you know, reasons where we get everybody touching it or right whatever. The, the plate is in the back. If you have your pledge, if you have your offering, you can drop that in the plate on the way out. Um, and then there are some ways where you can give online or you can just send. But thank you for supporting the church. So as we begin, um, as we enter into the Eucharist this morning, I do want to read our offertory sentence from Romans chapter 12, where Paul says this. He says, I appeal to you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship.
As we begin, I just want to give us a reminder, um, as I do every week, that this is the Lord's table. It's not the church's table. It's definitely not my table. Um, This is Christ offering himself to us. And as such, if you are a baptized member in the Christian church, you are welcome here. If you are online and in the area, we have a drive-through Eucharist happening at 11 a.m. You would come down to the church on the corner of Highland and 6th and enter in down by our, our youth house and come in to the front of the church and you can receive this communion this morning. Um, please come. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give Him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. For you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us into new life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the Please kneel as you are able. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made for us, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And we celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. 
Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ, our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you. Feed on him in your hearts through faith and with thanksgiving.
Behold him there, the risen lamb, my perfect spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the king of glory and of grace, but with The post-communion prayer can be found on page 12 of your bulletins, also on page 365 of the Book of Common Prayer. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. I just want to remind um, those who are online that we will have drive through Eucharist um, at 11 a.m., and now would you receive God's blessing. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in the knowledge of God and the love of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Please stand. And now, let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. One, two, one, two, three. Almighty God, Father of all mercy, here we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks. For you are good and full of loving kindness, pouring out your love to us and all whom you have made. We bless you, Lord. the world by Jesus Christ for 
You're the means of grace and the hope of glory. And give us such awareness of your mercies that we're truly thankful hearts we may show for your Ourselves to serve you walking in your 